It's October 30th, 2012, and you're listening to a special edition of the Energy Education Podcast. I'm Kevin Hurley. This podcast is a project of Fairwinds Energy Education. Fairwinds is a nonprofit organization whose mission is to educate policymakers, the public, and the next generation on matters of nuclear power and safety. The sole topic of tonight's conversation will be Hurricane Sandy and how it affected some of the operating U.S. nuclear power plants. So, without delay, we're joined by Arnie Gunderson, Fairwind's chief engineer, chief nuclear engineer, to help us understand the situation. Arnie, thanks for coming on. Hi, Kevin. Glad glad I could help. I wanted to start right out with sort of a review. You were on yesterday, on Democracy Now! yesterday and this morning, and um, you had basically gone over what you thought might happen uh, with the hurricane and the uh, nuclear power plants in its path. Can you just touch on that a bit? Uh, yeah, I was on Democracy Now! on Monday morning, and of course the, uh, the hurricane hit Monday night. Um, and we talked about the fact that when a nuclear plant, quote, safely shuts down, unquote, it really doesn't shut down because there's a lot of decay heat that's left behind. As much as 5% of the power of a nuclear reactor comes from decay heat. So uh, when you hear the platitudes about a nuclear plant safely shutting down, that means the rods dropped in or shot up and cooled the, and, and stopped the chain reaction, but there's still a lot of heat that has to be dissipated. You know, then I talked about this, um, uh, what I expected would happen, which would be something called the loss of off-site power. Uh, these plants are robust enough that they're not going to get blown over by an 85 mile an hour wind. So it never was a question of the effect of the wind on the power plant. It was actually a question of what the wind would do to the transmission lines. Uh, sure enough, um, after um, the, the hurricane hit, many transmission lines throughout the country uh, collapsed and left many power plants in the, uh, uh, in the area. Uh, without offsite power. Now, what's supposed to happen then was that the emergency diesels turn on and, um, and begin to provide power to the vital uh, systems. Well, what I talked about on Democracy Now! was that many of these plants, because it's October and that's a time when power plants refuel, uh, had their fuel not in the nuclear reactor but in the spent fuel pool. And 40 years ago, when these plants were being built, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission decided that uh, you didn't have to provide electricity to the pumps that cool the nuclear spent fuel pool. Um, so you had all this high-level nuclear waste in the pool, but in the event you lost off-site power, the NRC said, well, that's okay. Um, you don't have to provide power from the diesels. That was a... Um, uh, I guess the first eye opener for the audiences around the country based on the emails we're getting. And the other thing I talked about was the storm surge. Um, and, and I particularly talked about Oyster Creek for both of these, um, that a storm surge could likely uh, uh, hit the intake structures and, uh, and destroy some vital cooling pumps inside. That's what you said at the time. What actually happened now that we're a day into it? Well, everything I said hap would happen did happen. Um, at Oyster Creek, the uh, storm surge um, got so high that uh, it, it, uh, there's, there's conflicting reports. W one report says it was six inches below these vital pumps called the service water pumps. Another report says it was four inches above these vital pumps. But in any event, it, the, the vital pumps that cool the nuclear plant were, uh, were compromised by the storm surge. So that, but, but in addition, at Oyster Creek, the uh, power from off-site was lost um, because of high winds. And then at Oyster Creek, they um, at least considered, according to Reuters, uh, running fire hoses into the spent fuel pool to keep it cool. You see, once those pumps, that um, the, uh, the electric pumps, are shut down and there's no way to cool the pool, the only way to provide makeup water to the pool is through um, is through fire pumps. Now, you know, to my way of thinking, you know, the, the fire pumps and nuclear power plants really don't belong in the same sentence. Nuclear Regulatory Commission lexicon uh, it's perfectly acceptable to uh, make up for the evaporation from a spent fuel pool 
by, uh, by spraying fire water into it. But of course, the Oyster Creek plant was shut down for refueling, so if it had lost uh, cooling pumps, that would not have affected the reactor in this particular situation, right? Well, the, the Oyster Creek plant was shut down for refueling, and that's actually what made it um, uh, potentially more dangerous, uh, because all the nuclear fuel was um, not in a place where the diesels provided electricity. Um, so while there was less heat uh, because the nuclear fuel was in this in this high level waste pool, the um, the fact of the matter is that 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 pool was probably evaporating as much as uh, ten thousand gallons a day, uh, and likely even more fifteen thousand gallons a day of water. So that the fire pumps were needed to make up for the the water that was um, that was steaming off the fuel pool. Even um, uh, even Vermont Yankee, um, which is a very similar design, um, evaporates off about 3,000 gallons a day, and it's been shut down. It, it, the last time fuel was in its fuel pool was uh, more than a year ago. So mm-hmm. there's a lot of heat. You know, if you leave a pot on your fire, it's gonna it's gonna give off uh, steam, even if it doesn't boil. You'll you'll eventually empty the pot. So at Oyster Creek, they need it to keep the, uh, the, the fuel pool full. And uh, apparently, according to Reuters, we're actually considering using, um, using fire hoses to, uh, uh, to spray water into the nuclear fuel pool. So what's the status of the Oyster Creek fuel pool right now? Uh, Oyster Creek is still on alert. Uh, alert is um, the NRC has three, four categories of, um, of an emergency. And so hardly any plants ever go into an emergency status, but Oyster Creek is in an emergency status. Um, The alert status is the second level. One is relatively minor, four is god-awful, and um, the the two and three are are in between. What two means is that nuclear safety systems are in danger of being jeopardized, Um, and uh, that's a major concern. So here we are more than a day after the uh, uh, after the, the tidal surge um, came in, and um, Oyster Creek is still on um, uh, on alert status. So I understand the problem with the fuel pool and not being able to cool it because of the loss of offsite power. Basically, the diesels aren't set up in a nuclear plant to cool the fuel pool. But in this situation, you're saying that the water, the storm surge, came up, uh, there's two conflicting reports, either four inches above or six inches below the water pumps. To me, that seems like an incredibly close call. What if the reactor were running in that type of situation? Oh, that that would be worst case scenario. I mean, if Oyster Creek wasn't in a refuel and this tidal sur- surge hit, um, it's it's exactly what happened to Fukushima Daiichi at that point. You know, you've lost offsite power, and you can't cool the nuclear reactor because these pumps were um, uh, were flooded. Um, so uh, you know, we we can all be thankful that the plant uh, uh, was in a refueling outage and the power was down to less than one percent of what it would have been if it were uh, were operating. But uh, you know, the, the, there's a real lesson here. And the real lesson is that in light of global warming, we need to go back and reevaluate these nuclear plants to see if we've predicted um, what Mother Nature can really throw at us. You know, here's Oyster Creek, and it based its calculations. It was built in the 60s. So it looked back 100 years and said, well, this is the worst that Mother Nature can throw at us, and we'll build the pumps a little higher. But here, here we are now, almost 50 years since those decisions were made, and a superstorm comes in that uh, light intensified by global warming, and all the old rules are thrown out. This storm um, exceeded Oyster Creek's design bases event, and it's time for us not just to look at Oyster Creek, but uh, but every plant needs to take a look at its uh, design bases floods to see if um, we can wipe out the pumps that are along the water, whether it's the ocean or whether it's along a river. Um, that hasn't been done. And one of the obvious lessons from Fukushima should have been we've got to reevaluate the design basis flood. Um, and in the United States, we haven't. 
Now, here we have uh, Congress just questioned four NRC commissioners, and they all said, uh, with the exception of the new chairman, they all said that they felt that the United States regulatory system and the United States um, nuclear industry, the proponents of nuclear power, promoters of nuclear power, uh, were much better than the Japanese, and an accident couldn't happen here. Well, here we've got all of the precursor events to Fukushima. We've got a loss of offsite power, and then when the plant went over to its diesels, it needed to rely on the cooling system, and we have what's called the loss of the ultimate heat sink. So the two precursor incidents of Fukushima happened at, um, uh, at Oyster Creek, and yet we have four NRC commissioners who are telling us it can't happen here. Um, I think we really need to reevaluate our regulatory system and, um, and, and, and give our regulators some teeth to do what's right as opposed to uh, uh, mimic what the nuclear promoters want to hear. So it sounds like a little bit of luck got us through this one. Where do we go from here? I don't know how long Oyster Creek will be shut down as a result of this. Uh, they were in a 21-day outage. And um, I'm sure they will be shut down longer than that because of the flooding in the intake structure. Um, but if, it, if all we do is clean up the intake structure and start back up, they haven't learned a single lesson. Uh, one would hope that they reevaluate their design bases and say, oh my God, we, we built the intake structure too low. We've got to get it up higher. Or we need submersible pumps, pumps that run underwater. Um, if that happens, Exelon has already said uh, a year and a half ago that any more expenditures on Oyster Creek and they'll shut it down. You know, I think that's really the key here. And the back of regulators' minds are that they risk losing some of these old single-unit nuclear plants because uh, the people that own them aren't going to spend any more money on them. So, you know, they'll, they'll stick with outdated design bases that risk the public's health and safety but um, uh, but keep these plants running. I think the Nuclear Regulatory Commission's role right now is to enable these old plants to continue to operate. Arnie, last question. Can people rest assured that the worst is behind us uh, as far as Hurricane Sandy and its effect on U.S. nuclear plants, at least for uh, this round? Yeah, you know, I think we should, we can say... Uh, Oyster Creek is not going to become Fukushima, that there's enough attention. And now that they've rolled in, uh, you know, fire pumps to, to keep the fuel pool cool, um, you know, it, it, will, uh, it will continue to be cooled, albeit abnormal, it'll still be cool. Um, we still may see some flooding on the inland plants, especially along the Susquehanna River. Um, but I would suspect that um, management will be on the alert and have, um, you know, backup uh, backup pumps in place. Um, I think we've seen the worst, yes. All right, Arnie, thanks so much for coming on tonight. All right, that I could, Kevin. Thanks. All right, this has been a special edition of the Energy Education Podcast. It's October 30th, 2012. The podcast is a project of Fairwinds Energy Education, a nonprofit whose mission is to educate policymakers, the public, and the next generation. You can catch us back here next Sunday at 8 p.m. Eastern for the next edition of the Energy Education Podcast. I'm Kevin Hurley. Thanks for listening.